To get our local multiplayer system set up, I'm going to begin by going through the project that I have at the moment, what I'm working from. I've set this up in a way where pretty much anyone should be able to follow along with this in any type of project you're working with, whether it's a brand new project or you're trying to implement this into an existing project. So just having an understanding of the classes that I'm already using and the things I have in the project should help you to understand what you might need to add or the classes you're going to need to integrate into this local multiplayer spawning system. So to begin, the controllable class I have, again, this isn't specific or required to follow along, but I'm just using the default third person character blueprint. I've changed the mesh just for kind of visual flair and added a custom material that I'll go into a little bit later. But besides that, everything is as standard in the event graph, just default movement, nothing else. Then for the level, this is pretty much an empty map just with a floor again, just for visual flair. I do have four different player start objects in here. Uh, you're gonna need that to follow along. So if you already have your level, just drag in four different player starts from the tab over here. And we're gonna make some amendments to these a little bit later. Then the final thing is in the project settings, of course, you will need some input for your character. If you're using a template, of course, this will come with it. And we will be coming back to look a little bit more at the inputs in a moment as well. But as long as you have these basic things, you're pretty much ready to follow along with the rest of the content in this playlist. And for the material, I did mention that we'd look at this. So in the materials folder, all I've done is created a flat base material. So this is just a very simple color-based material with metallic, specular, and roughness. All of these have been parameterized just to make them accessible then in the material instances. And these are going to be assigned depending on which player you're controlling, just to show a quick way that we can visualize that you have four different players and also to sync them up to the same player start each time. So that's the overview of what I already have and what you may need if you wanted to follow along exactly. So the first step is going to be implementing our player controllers. Like I said, I already have four of these in the level. They're all spaced evenly apart. When you've placed these in, I've also rotated them so that the players will take up the initial rotation. So they will be facing the, towards each other. And the only thing I've changed is that each one has a unique tag. So if you go to the player start tag just here, you can see I've got uh, tag zero, tag one, tag two, and then tag three. So these are going to help us control which character and controller to spawn at which different point in the level. And all of these have their default auto receive input set to disabled. So with those aspects ready, the next thing we're going to need to do is I'm just gonna close these for now. And we're going to want three different classes. The first is going to be our game mode. This is going to be the main control for the spawning and also kind of managing and keeping track of who is being spawned where. So we're going to create a new blueprint class of type game mode base, and I'm just going to call this one BP underscore game mode. Then the way that we want to do this is we're actually going to kind of override some of the default Unreal spawning. So if we go and manage that, first of all, what we want to do is inside of the project settings, we will set the default game mode. So go to maps and modes, set the default game mode to be BP underscore game mode. And we want to change the default pawn that we're spawning. We don't want to immediately spawn in our players. Uh, we want this to be a kind of drop-in session is the way that I said that we would approach this. So we don't want to default to having four players. We'll have no players. And then when we press start, we will spawn someone in. So the way that we're going to do that is rather than using our default pawn straight away here, we'll create another new class of type pawn this time. And this one, I'm just going to call input receiver or BP underscore input receiver. And this is just going to be a completely empty class, pretty much. We're going to add a small amount of logic in here, but this will be the thing that we spawn. And it's just going to wait to receive input if a player presses a button. So if we go back into the project settings again, we can now set the default pawn class to be the BP underscore input receiver. And whilst we're here, we may as well add the input as well. So I'm going to add one extra input under the action mappings, and we'll call this one start. I'm just going to assign this to the special button right. So this will be the start button on game pads. And I'll also add the option to join by pressing enter for the keyboard, just so we have some extra options here. We can come into the BP underscore input receiver and we can pretty much start adding some logic here. So we don't need this to tick. We don't need any of this really on the begin play. So we can come in, set the class defaults to uh, not tick, just to save a little bit of performance. And we want one thing and that is going to be to receive the input from the start. So we're gonna get the action events for the start input. 
and we can just test this is working by doing a print string. And if we press play, we should have four of these different input receivers spawned. So we can check that over here. Uh, we have our four player starts and we have just one input receiver does. And that's just because I forgot a very important thing. We're only going to spawn one of these by default. We're gonna handle the spawning of the rest of them in the game mode. And in fact, that reminds me there's another change we'll need to make, but at least we can test for the input to begin. So if we click into the screen, press enter, we can see that we're getting the start input. So this is something we actually want to address. We don't want to allow the Unreal Engine to use the default spawning logic here. Uh, because by default, what it's doing is in C++ basically there is a function before event begin play, which is going to initialize everything in the game mode. That is searching in the level for a player controller. And the problem here is that it could pick randomly between whichever one of these it finds first. And we want full control over exactly how and when things are being spawned in. So what we're going to do is go back into the, the uh, maps and modes, go back to the game mode, and we can set this to none. So now by default, absolutely nothing will be spawned when we press play, which is why we're down here, uh, now in the floor. And that's perfectly fine, but that means that we now have full control over if and when the input receivers are going to be spawned. This also means we can start passing around things like the information from the player starts. So we can pass which tag is going to be assigned to each input receiver. And in fact, we can expose a variable in the input receiver now to help manage that. So if we remove the print string, we'll come back and address this later. We can create a new variable in here. We'll call this one player index. We're gonna turn this to an integer. That should be fine for now. So this is going to be assigned when the, uh, the start button is pressed which is going to allow us to keep track of exactly which position each player should be spawned. So we're gonna get the same result every time we'll kind of exclude any randomness from the default Unreal spawning system that you'd normally expect to see. And in fact, before wrapping up, because there's only one thing that this class really needs to do, and that is to pass a message to the current game mode, I'm gonna handle this through the use of an interface. So if we go and create another Blueprint class, this time from the Blueprint dropdown here, and we're just gonna create a standard Blueprint interface. We'll call this one BPI underscore game mode as this interface will actually be on the game mode class. And this just allows us to avoid casting and safely pass a message to and from other classes uh, without necessarily guaranteeing they're there. It's essentially the same as doing a cast and passing a message to a specific function, but I just find that interfaces are a little bit safer and a little bit more reusable. So we're gonna name this new function spawn player, and we want to provide this an input, which the first one will be the uh, integer value, the player index and we'll just name this one to current player index. And just in case we wanted to do something like uh, letting people back back out and keep track of the different receivers as well, what we can do is we can create another input as well and we can pass a reference to the player receiver which is going to be calling this function. So we'll find the BP underscore player receiver. Uh, it's not player receiver, sorry, it's input receiver. And we're just gonna set an object reference to that and then we'll call this one input receiver. And then finally, the other thing when working with interfaces is if you're not familiar with interfaces, what we're going to do is go into the BP underscore game mode, go into the full blueprint editor. We need to go to the class settings, go to interfaces and find the interface that we've made. You can do that by just typing BPI if you've named it the same thing. And we then get this interface call over here. So this can now be called from any other class, even without casting to the game mode. So what we're basically going to do is from this class, we're just going to get the game mode inside of the input receiver whenever this is pressed. And rather than casting and checking exactly what class we're talking to, we can just call that interface function, the spawn player. We're gonna send that a message and we'll pass all of this information across. So we're gonna pass in the player index, and a reference to self. And all of this is done, as I said, without casting, it saves a little bit of memory, it's a little bit safer. At worst, if the class that we're calling, so the game mode here, doesn't implement this interface, meaning that you haven't included it just here to the right, all that's gonna happen is that nothing will happen essentially here. We're not gonna get any null references or errors. Uh, it will just be a call that's made and not received. Then the final thing is inside of the BPI underscore game mode, we're just going to add an output. This is just a visual thing that I like to do. I'm gonna set this to be a type of Boolean and change this to be called return. Now this is optional because we're not gonna use this Boolean, but the difference that this makes is if we go back now into the game mode, if we update this, you can see that changed from a yellow color to black. 
and this means that you can now click into this and it's essentially like creating a function just up here. We can actually house our logic in the same way that we would through a function here. We can now control all of our spawning logic inside of this interface call. And for whatever reason, you only get access to do this if you have some kind of return node. So what I tend to do is if the interfaces won't be using a specific return value, I'll just create a default Boolean, name it return, and that kind of reminds me that I don't need to pass anything here, but it will expose this for me to use as a function. And with that done, that is the bulk of the classes that we'll need. We won't need the interface anymore. This is pretty much the interface fleshed out. We won't need the input receiver anymore, I don't think. This should be the only function call that we need to make from the input receiver to let the game mode know that we've spawned a player or that someone's essentially pressed start and would like a player. So the rest of the logic to get this local multiplayer system working is all going to be inside of the game mode. So for that reason, it's going to be quite a long topic. There are several different topics, kind of subtopics we need to do to find things, to spawn things and to track them to allow this drop in system. So I'll leave this video here as a kind of setup topic. And then in the next video, we'll get into the, the meat of the content, which is to come back in, find all of the player starts, spawn all, all of our input receivers, and then allow for the players to be spawned into the world. Also remember, if you didn't do it previously, when I mentioned this at the beginning of the video, once you've got your four different player starts in the level, do be sure to change all of the player tags to a, a unique tag, as we're going to be passing that into the input receiver. And again, this is starting uh, based on a zero based index. So starting zero, going around to one, two, and three. So once you have that, again, you're caught up and ready to follow along with the rest of the process. So thank you for watching. I've seen all of the comments which seem to be asking for some uh, online networked multiplayer stuff. So I will be looking into the type of project. I can see if I can extend this to make this a networked project or something more interesting might work uh, as a different type of project rather than this more lobby based local multiplayer thing. So I'll play around with some ideas and based on the feedback I've been getting, it looks as though I will be creating that uh, networked multiplayer playlist as well or adding it to this multiplayer playlist at least. As always I'd just like to say a huge thank you for everyone supporting me over on the Patreon page. The support there is greatly appreciated and allows me to keep making content like this on a weekly basis. And otherwise if you enjoyed the video or found this useful please do leave a like and share the video around that really helps and remember to subscribe and hit the notification bell to get the latest updates whenever the new videos go live so that you don't miss the next topic in the playlist. As ever though, thanks for watching, and I will see you all next time.